We're good. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody to session 100 of Libraries in Response. Uh, started, as you may recall, some of you probably were there, uh, over four years ago in March of 2020, when the uh, pandemic was declared. And uh, since then, we have tracked the uh, the pandemic and boy here I lost this okay that's showing right sorry uh, and we have been going pretty much nonstop with some pauses. For well, we're in our fifth year now, and uh, we've had over ten thousand registrations for the series, and we've had even more uh, people view the recordings that are all logged and archived on on the YouTube channel, Libraries and Response YouTube channel. Uh, they're all there. We keep getting asked questions about that. Can I wear it? They're all there. So I'll send that out in another message when we update on this we'll send out the that the recording is up as soon as we get it so um this is where we're on the road i'm i'm at the uh, cpdp conference in brussels as you may have seen on the announcement it's a big data privacy conference and uh there are a lot of people here a lot of academics and a lot of uh, uh political or civil servants trying to sort out this the the policy needs around this and you know whoa so it it, it feels a little bit like the the internet governance forum there's like there's a million branches and it's hard for anything to get done because there's no there's no central power over this it's just all has to be sort of agreed on uh with some notable exceptions being the the primary actors that are providing these uh these tools. Uh, this is our hundredth session. We've got Nathan Sanders, affiliate with the uh, Bertman Klein Center at Harvard, who has just co-authored a paper on uh, on a public AI, which is going to be one of our uh, main focuses today. The idea of a public AI infrastructure, something is like like a public option or like all the public services that we take for granted, like roads and parks and libraries. Uh, well, right now, they're all private. And so that's a that's a big open question. We think it's a really fascinating notion. Uh, and we'll also get into literacy. So what does that even mean? Since we can't actually define AI, it's hard to define what literacy in AI means. It's also interesting we use literacy to apply to these technologies that are that are really not about liter literature or even traditional literacy, but that's what we that's what we talk about it. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, uh, kind of open global consortium of, of libraries doing interesting things, mostly around technology. Our uh, partner and uh, co-producer hosting and recording, though I'm actually running it right now, uh, is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, our sponsor is IMLS. We so appreciate that this year. Our other sponsors are the Internet Society and uh, the State Libraries of Michigan, New Jersey, and Texas. Very, very much appreciate. And a couple of media sponsors, Library Journal and Brought Back Breakfast. Uh, this is We've adopted this uh, image and this term uh, to kind of encapsulate what we think is happening. It's a polycrisis in so what's this word has been around for a little over a year, as far as I can tell. It's not just about multiple things happening at the same time. It's about how all these various crises actually interrelate and uh, and and support each other to amplify their effect. Here, the world is longing for the simple days of uh, contemplating nuclear annihilation. <clears throat> well, our notion is there's behind this world there's a whole worldwide network of libraries that are 
that are backing up the world against all these crises, as we have touched on all these through the four years we've been, been working on. Here's a definition of Wikipedia that is available to you where we actually have uh, uh, the Cascade Institute coming on in a couple of weeks to talk about this very thing. Uh, next week, we're going to dive a little further into public AI uh, as well. Uh, these are different AI sessions we've had. They're all, as again, on the Libraries and Response YouTube channel. Look them up. There's some great stuff. Uh, this is where I am right now. This is uh, in, in Brussels, the, the uh, international conference. Just a jillion people here. Really, really nice place. Uh, I'll kind of skip the travel log, but you know, I'll talk. And this is the room where where I'm sitting right now. It's, it's the library room. Uh, and they have a couple of books here to prove it's a library, but it's just another meeting room. And uh, here you see Nathan and Stephen is on his way. Um, I thought this uh, uh, worthy of promoting. This is uh, 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 presentations to be given by Tina on June the 4th. Tina is with the Santa Fe Institute, which is a leading think tank on, on uh, complexity, uh, you know, multiple systems interacting, creating even more compounding complexity. This is the place they try to uh, deconstruct all that. And it, so it gets all these cross disciplines in there to, to work on it together. And so she's going to be talking about AI here on June, the, June the 4th. And uh, so what really gets me was her last uh, statement here is that digitally savvy public is essential part of the solution. And that's our, that's our pitch. That's what I'm trying the point I'm trying to make here, which is all about uh, governance and, uh, system controls and regulatory restraints, which are all great, all necessary, but they're inadequate. They're insufficient anyway to actually accomplish security. Any kind of cybersecurity is as good as the, well, let me put it another way. It relies on users to make it safe, that careless, clueless users can undermine any, any regime of security. Uh, but there's very little talk about that here other than what we're talking about. So this is a great uh, quote uh, from Nathan here, publicly developed and owned AI models and computing infrastructure could democratize the technology itself, creating an open platform for innovation and guarantees about the availability, equitability, and sustainability of AI technology. It's a brilliant notion. Uh, and I'm so anxious to hear Nathan explain the how we're gonna get there uh, because it's, it's complicated. Uh, in any case, I will do that right now. I will stop and welcome Nathan and um, say any more about yourself you'd like to, Nathan, and um, and then take it away. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you uh, inviting me to be part of this conversation, Don, and to meet all of you. Um, so Don asked me to speak for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and then I, I do regret it. I just got it about 20 minutes to spend with you all before I have to go to my next meeting, but I'd love for this to be a conversation. So I, I'm going to try and go a little quickly and at a high level so we can leave time for conversation and discussion. Um, just very briefly, as, as Don said, my background is that I'm a, a researcher and affiliate at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center. My background is in data science and machine learning research. My research focus is on finding ways to use technology to make democracy more participatory. And of course, I think there are really exciting ways that AI can be part of that kind of agenda. Uh, right now, I'm working really closely with Bruce Schneier here at the Harvard Kennedy School. We're writing a book together about all the ways that AI is changing democracy, with public AI being a piece of that. Uh, I'm going to share in the chat two relevant links to some of our work. One is a project that I'll be talking about in a moment, and one is the article that uh, Don just mentioned that he asked me to speak about today. Um, okay, so the thesis of what I want to talk about is to really make a pitch that AI is too important to entrust to corporations alone will have far reaching and I hope really valuable impacts on our society and also many risks. And the public sector should be an active participant in mitigating those risks and building technology that works in the public interest. And I'm gonna make this argument in three pieces. I'm gonna talk about reasons that I, I really am optimistic about applications of AI. I think there are real legitimate publicly interested beneficial use cases for AI that I think all of us can get excited about. And that's true, even though there are also risks and there are also harms that we need to be very concerned about. But I want to start on that optimistic note 
And then I want to talk about trust, which I think is the key limiter that keeps many of us from fully buying into that optimistic vision uh, and the main challenge that we know we need to solve to enable those beneficial use cases. And then I'm going to talk about public AI and a public option for AI as a potential solution as an alternative to the corporate AI system that we have today. So let me start with the optimistic piece. I shared a link to a website called uh, Maple, mapletestimony.org. Uh, this is one of the civic technology projects that my colleagues and I have been building together. Maple is the Massachusetts platform for legislative engagement. It's an example of the type of civic tech platform that exists throughout the world. You know, in Europe, I want to call out, we have colleagues at make.org who are doing a lot of really similar work in the European context. Uh, what Maple does is it simply makes it easier for constituents to interact with their legislators, for example, to submit written testimony as part of hearings on bills. Um, we've been working on this for years. The very first features on our website are super straightforward. We, you know, it's basically leaving a comment on a website and turning that into public testimony as part of a legislative hearing process. Super straightforward. Uh, but we're really excited for a project like Maple about the additional features and accessibility we can create using AI. We're really excited about using neural machine translation, AI translation tools, to make it so that anybody, no matter what language they speak, can interact with our legislature, even though it acts only in English. We're really excited about using AI to summarize and answer questions about and add context to bills, because we know the legislative text of those bills is often impenetrable, it's dense, it's written in a way that's not meant to be accessible, but we can make it better. And we're really excited about using AI tools to help people find consensus, even when there are diverse viewpoints in the room. A primary function of our site is gathering diverse testimony on each bill in the legislature and having tools that help people understand and synthesize all of that, especially for controversial issues where there may be hundreds or thousands of pieces of constituent testimony, we think it'd be really valuable. Um, but the question is, can we rely on AI models to responsibly support those use cases? Will people consider AI models like large language models from companies like OpenAI too biased to summarize legislation? Will they consider them to be inauthentic um, reporters if they're trying to express themselves or have their text translated? Will they trust AI to do that? Uh, will they be? Will we as a civic tech platform have ongoing access to these tools? What guarantees are there that we'll be able to access them in the same way as much larger companies or partners? Um, you know, for example, think of Microsoft and OpenAI and the special privilege relationship that those companies have. Will projects like ours continue to have access to these tools at a first class level in the future at affordable prices. And you know, looking at other examples of tech infrastructure, such as ride sharing platforms like Uber that have implemented features like surge pricing that completely makes sense for that business, but are really a disaster for accessibility and for customers. What would that look like in the AI space and how could that change over time? So this brings me to the point about trust as the primary barrier for many of these publicly interested use cases. Uh, I, you know, my opinion is that we can't trust corporate AI to act in our interests because they have a responsibility to act in their interests. They have a, a literal fiduciary responsibility to look out for their corporate bottom line first. And we can see all sorts of examples throughout history and throughout the tech industry of what that means. Think of uh, if you use tools like Google or Amazon today to search for information or products, do you trust that the first result return is what you need? Probably not, I sort of hope you don't. I, I think probably we all recognize the first result return is the one that's in the most interest of Google and Amazon. It's the ad that they've been paid to place. It's the product that they get the biggest commission from when it's sold. What does that look like uh, in AI for interacting with large language models that also represent corporate interests? Uh, an interesting example of this that many people have written about is uh, Amazon's Alexa, one of the kind of early examples of AI powered um, chatbots that people interacted with. Uh, People have found that when you ask Alexa for information about its competitors, it'll happily tell you that Google is a monopoly and has all these problems. If you ask Alexa about its corporate parent, about Amazon, it'll give you lots of flattering information about the parent company. And that's not surprising at all. Would we? How could we expect a product built by a corporation that has fiduciary obligations to its shareholders to do anything differently? But that's probably not the kind of um, response that we wanna get from a tool that's being used for public interest and, and not to represent a company. Um, one more example I'll give you uh, that I think really challenges trust from um, corporate technology providers is the example of all of our smartphones. Uh, our smartphones have really been built, designed to last one to two years with planned obsolescence, a not a technical limitation, but a planned um, feature, so to speak, that they will become less useful after one to two years and that we'll have to replace them. Uh, that's in the best interest of the companies because it makes it buy more, us buy more products. That's clearly not in the best interest of us as individual consumers who have to pay again for a new device. 
it's clearly not in the best interest of society who have to deal with the mountains of e-waste that comes from them. So uh, I think we have all these examples of the mistrust uh, that big tech and you know, corporate uh, private development of these technologies in general has bred over years. And we're seeing that already transfer to the AI space. So when I talk about uh, AI with people, when I talk about the public interested applications, like for our project Maple that I just described, I see a lot of skepticism and mistrust in the people I speak with. People tell me, uh, AI, it's really just investor hype. It's companies trying to get VC investment. It's not real. People say it doesn't do what it says it can. People make all these claims about AI and they're just not real. People say AI is built on stolen data. It's not properly licensed. The creators of the data that the models are built on are not being compensated. People say AI has these enormous energy uses and it's not sustainable for us to develop and use it. And people call out that AI can propagate misinformation and it can give us answers that are wrong. And all those are, from my point of view, completely legitimate concerns, but I think they're more, they're better understood as concerns about the corporate infrastructure and the capitalist system under which the AI is primarily developed today versus concerns about the underlying technology themselves. Basically, I would say it doesn't have to be that way. Those concerns are real, but it doesn't have to be that way. So this brings me to my, my third and final point, which is about public AI as a possible solution for this. So let me lay out for you the vision that many of us who are working in the space have articulated for what a public AI option could look like. It means governments actively investing in building and maintaining the compute infrastructure that would be used by both public agencies and could be made available to private actors that are fee to do the research and model development and training. That's a huge part of AI. Uh, that doesn't have to mean that government does everything. It doesn't have to mean that government eliminates uh, the private sector actors in the space. That better, that uh, government funded computer infrastructure could be built with chips from NVIDIA, for example. It could even be built with uh, existing services from cloud resources like Amazon to AWS. Uh, but it would mean that government is directly funding AI model development on top of that infrastructure, directly funding research and innovation in model training and architecture design and machine learning research happening within public agencies. And the reason I think that's important and exciting is that one, it gives us the opportunity for more open and transparent research. You know, today, the most widely used, most important AI models have so little transparency, we don't even know what their data sources are. We don't know the primary uh, approaches under which they're trained or what uh, risks were considered as part of that process or uh, what choices were made in the design of those models to mitigate those risks. But under uh, public AI development, we could mandate that kind of transparency. Uh, the second really important exciting differentiator is that we could have political oversight, democratic oversight of these model development processes. We could have all of us, our voice as constituents of a democracy, our voice in the room when those decisions about the responsible and ethical development of AI are, are considered. So questions like, do we license and compensate the creators of the data that's used to train the model? Questions like, what labor practices do we use for the so-called ghost workers, the human labor that goes into labeling and supervising machine learning models? How are they, those workers treated? Questions like, how do we go about mitigating bias and controlling for misinformation in the outputs of AI models? All of that work and research could be done under public oversight in a public AI model. And uh, my, my vision for this includes large language models like ChatGPT, which are of course of such great interest today, but it would go beyond that to include uh, a variety of AI research, all the types of models that are important today and those that could be developed in the future, uh, diffusion models for image generation, and so many things that I'm sure haven't been invented yet, but will be an important part of our future. Uh, and then lastly, this vision for public AI involves public agencies that operate as a service, as a service, um, uh, provided universally uh, and at a reasonable cost, those AI models, giving the whole economy a uh, foundational guarantee of accessibility to what I think will be an important part of the infrastructure of our economy for the 21st century and for the future, uh, so that it's not only controlled in private hands, not only available to um, corporate partners. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, well, obviously, there's a lot of investment and there's a lot of political will required to get this, uh, this kind of investment to happen. And I'm, I'm realistic about how difficult that is. I think getting there starts with broadening the conversation beyond regulation of AI, regulation of private sector activity. In my view, that kind of regulation is necessary, but not sufficient. And we should broaden the public conversation about AI to include the idea of public model development. It includes recognizing the shortcomings in the corporate AI system, everything that we've just talked about re regarding trust and using those concerns to build a political movement and a public movement towards this kind of public investment. 
And uh, I also want to call out, you know, there are also reasons to be concerned about AI developed under a public model, just as under a corporate model, and there may be different reasons. Basically, AI developed under public systems will reflect all the flaws of those public and democratic systems, just like corporate AI reflects the flaws of the corporate system. That means it could be used intentionally by governments to propagandize, just as corporations may use their AI tools to benefit their interests. It could be misused for national interests in a way that's not favorable for other countries. And that's, that's I think, a very legitimate concern. And it could be used to enable military applications. You know, I think clearly a lot of the AI development that is happening within public agencies today is being applied to defense applications, and that's certainly a concern. But I'll, I'll just leave you with these uh, thoughts in summary. Uh, my viewpoint is that we need an alternative to corporate AI, that regulation of AI development is necessary but not sufficient, that we should think more broadly about what systems we can use to better govern the construction and distribution of AI models in the future. And in my view, our democratic processes, the processes that we use to govern our, our government agencies are the best available system for doing that. And then lastly, that governments worldwide should actively be discussing the investment in public AI infrastructure. And it should happen now because what the government does today, what governments do today, will shape the private sector ecosystem in the future as well. So I'll stop there and I would love to engage in discussion with you all. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I think feel free to, to unmute or if anyone has commentary or feedback, I'd love to know your thoughts. Um, Kathy, I see your comment in the chat. Um, uh, I, I wonder if you could articulate some of the, the particular concerns that you're thinking about, either if you want to unmute and speak or use the chat. Um, well, I can speak in a general sense. I would just say, uh, yes, as I said in my conclusion, I think there are real concerns about AI developed under the corporate system, and there would be under the public system as well. And I think there are different concerns. Um, I think it is valuable to have AI developed under these two different systems that we have uh, alternatives uh, for people's choice so that we can leverage some of the benefits that I think would exist for AI develop, developed under a public system and help set a foundational floor of expectations it would actually sort of raise all boats, lift the expectations that we can reasonably apply to the corporate sector AI as well. And I think that's worth doing, even though there would be limitations and, and concerns about the development of public AI. Kathy, I, I see your follow-up about the example of book bans. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. We do have flaws in our democratic processes. Uh, I think book bans in some jurisdictions are a great example of that. And I would have concerns about that propagating through AI research. Um, I, I think there are similar concerns in the corporate model, and I'm, I feel more favorably about the model where I, as a democratic constituent, had input to that process than I do about what that looks like where I'm just uh, a customer, and as an individual, a very small, probably meaningless customer uh, to a corporation, I don't have political oversight of that process. Um, I see a comment from Jennifer about the relative uh, resources between private and public entities. Um, from my vantage point, that's actually one of the one of uh, key reasons why it's interesting to consider public AI. There are very few institutions that can afford to do the kind of large scale training of, for example, pre-trained transformer models that are used in large language modeling today. Most companies cannot afford to do that. Uh, OpenAI has claimed that they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on the compute runs that are behind recent versions of ChatGPT. Uh, very vanishingly few companies can do that. Very few private actors can do that. But actually a lot of governments can. You know, certainly in the US context, you know, we're talking about a tiny fraction of the U.S. federal budget. For many other developed nations, similarly, there are a lot of resources uh, available for that. Uh, obviously, just as in the corporate market, there is a obviously a great range of capacities across um, public governments around the world. And I would have a concern about the uh, inequality and differential access to this kind of capability for smaller and larger countries, richer and poorer countries. And so I think international efforts that try and 
um, you know, organized under the UN or elsewhere that try and combine the resources of many governments are very interesting models to consider as well. Um, well, I think uh, I have to drop off in just a minute myself, but let me just say I'm so glad to be a part of the conversation with you all. I would love to continue it, so I'm going to leave my email address in the chat. And I would welcome anybody who wants to talk more. Oh, I'm sorry. I misspelled my own address. Let me fix that. There we go. Um, I would welcome you to reach out. I'd be glad to continue the conversation. And thank you for including me today. Okay. Wow. Uh, fantastic, Nathan. I can't wait to see that again. We're just dealing with a little bit of uh, glitchy tech out here on this end. And... Uh, I'm sorry you're squeezed for time because I've got a list of questions. Uh, the big one is on implementation. So you're just going to have to come back. And we're going to have to dive in to the mechanics, the politics, the technology, the finance of public AI. Can you do that in in uh, 90 seconds and be, and be on time for your meeting? Uh, I, I don't know if I can do that in 90 seconds. Maybe the best thing I can do is just point people towards the article I posted at the beginning, uh, the piece um, with the, uh, our co-author Norm Eisen at the Brookings Institution, uh, where we lay all of this out in a little bit more detail. But Don, you're correct to point out there's so many considerations for what this model would look like. And I'd love to engage with you all in that discussion and, and think through this in more detail. I saw that your next speaker is also going to be on the subject of public AI. And I'd love to join you for that if, uh, if that's possible. That'll, as be, well. that'll be a week from today. And uh, that is a whole group that's working on this, and you'll you'll get the uh, the note on it. And um, it, it's just so fascinating. It has to be pursued. It has to be investigated. There'll be discovery, even if it becomes impossible to accomplish. We will learn so much about how it's done, how to how to make it more neutral. And I, I think all your points about you know reliant on these private corporations who are directed by the directors who are not so interested in making great technology. They're interested in making money off of technology. And so they give orders to companies to maximize profits off and degrades the quality of services. Okay, won't keep you another time. Uh, I know we've made you late. Thanks so much. We're going to have you back. And uh, so right now we have Stephen Weiber who has been with us, uh, well, since the beginning, since the before the beginning. Stephen and I have worked on uh, uh, universal public access. Every community should be connected uh, and that there should be a hub, an access hub, a free or low fee place that people could go and take advantage of these amazing technologies. However, they're being misused. They still are being used to, well, what we're doing right now uh, is, I mean, what it, what it used to take for to do a closed circuit conference like this, it wasn't that many years ago, you needed a $100,000 system, uh, you know, from Cisco to just have a video conference. So a long way from the olden days. But Stephen is here today as a speaker, rather than as a co-host and, and a co-producer, to talk about uh, so-called AI literacy. So I made the point earlier that all these uh, controls, regimes, and technologies and everything are fine, uh, but uh, trained, educated users are essential to uh, having the, the overall uh, infrastructure system work, uh, as it's true with uh, automobiles, right? So we all have to have, we all have to be trained drivers to share the road and be safe as we can. Uh, and so how does that happen? Just on your own? I mean, even people like Nathan are having trouble keeping up with the developments. So we're all struggling to understand what this stuff is about. So the idea that there's just sort of a plateau of knowledge and you're cool, you know, that hasn't made sense for a long time. And AI has made it even, it's made even less sense in, in, uh, the age of AI, which I, I think we can safely say we've entered into uh, because of the acceleration of the developments. There's a lot of news, and I'm sure you're all keeping track of it. But I think at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen uh, 
So we've never shared a screen like this. We're always, you know, an ocean apart most of the time. And so he has come into uh, Brussels uh, from The Hague, which is not so far away, but, you know, uh, to be with us today and uh, has made it just in time. And welcome, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. I've... A, a, a bit being here also talking about the copyright aspect of AI and AI and research. So we're doing all the angles of AI at the moment. But um, so yeah, a, 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 I'm going to slide off to the side okay, here. Well, I, I think we, we can we can push the computer back. No, a little no, bit no. I, 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 I think the microphone is just wants you to, <laughs> to okay. be on on stage there. So uh, I think I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm conscious this is a, a, an area where we've got actually lots of people on 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 the call who will have a lot to input about practical experiences and, and 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 practical work around thinking through how how libraries how anyone can provide AI literacy what AI literacy in in, in general means um and I think I know it's clearly it's, it's an area that's an emerging it's an area that's going to continue to emerge I think just as Don said just now it's not like you can get a certificate and then you're sorted for life <laughs> It, it, it's definitely an area where learning how to learn is, is going to be really key rather than just ticking a couple of boxes and, and 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 then being done and so how that affects things i think though i don't know i i, I suppose I don't know, again just picking up on a couple of things that, that don talked about clearly libraries do have a range of ways there are a number of characteristics of libraries that make that their work particularly valuable in this area that make that make what we're doing particularly useful and 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 mean that there is a role to play and that hopefully we can convince we should convince others there's a role to play and ideally obviously make sure that libraries are being adequately funded to play this role um i think what one angle is the one that don already mentioned that i know libraries as a connectivity hub but i think crucially seeing understanding connectivity in that really the the broadest possible sense because connectivity is more than just a cable or a wi-fi connection it's about having the content to actually the, the content to actually access it's about having devices but crucially it's about competence and confidence it's about the ability to make the most of the internet to make the most of the information available and so to a large extent given how much the internet is being shaped by ai given how much and what you see when you turn on the computer is shaped by this, it is shaped by algorithms, et cetera. Being able to understand building up this confidence is, is a logical one. And I think second point is that actually, I don't know, information has always followed a process in order to get to us. There have always been models, power dynamics, decisions, conscious or unconscious, predecessor of algorithms, whatever you want to sort of I don't know whatever the butterfly or economic model is that has meant that a certain piece of information was seen as being fit to print in a book and that book was seen as being fit to put in a library and that the librarian was seen see, saw that book as being fit to put in there put, put in there and I think in in some ways actually AI literacy is is not so far from information literacy and um, that process of actually understanding what is the process that leads to what you see in front of you what you have in front of your face now this isn't to say that that um this is something that that librarians can do without training or without support i think that um there's this huge potential because of this role as a, a meaningful connectivity hub because of this role in understanding the basics of looking to explain the basics of how information arrives in front of our faces in the form that it does. That does require training. I think just as, as Don was saying, AI, AI literacy is an ongoing process. The ability to teach AI literacy is certainly an ongoing process and, 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 and librarians need that. At the same time, clearly it, it, it is something that I think we'd argue is, is absolutely essential. It's really not clear who else is, 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 is going to do that. Um, schools are great if you are of school age. But having this community infrastructure that's there, that has this track record, that has this recognized role in information is, is really interesting. Um, as was in, in terms of the way that libraries are, are actually going about this, um, there are already some really good examples out there of, of, of libraries that are offering the basics of, of AI. I know, already for 
a number of years now. Libraries in Finland have been offering have, have been offering it. I think probably since the last time AI came into in, in, into fashion, when Will Smith made a, a, a film about it. Um, these ideas have been around for some time. People are teaching about the basics. I think one of the really interesting things right now is that obviously AI is is something that that can can be polarizing. There will be evangelists often because they 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 think it will probably help the the, the stock price. And AI washing is a thing right now that we have to be a little bit cautious about. Um, there are obviously the the negative sides of AI when it's used purely for profit without regard to to privacy, without regard to the equity impact, without regard to the harm that that it might do, or the the damage it might do to the diversity of information out there. Um, at the same time, the, the the work that libraries are doing in order to get people used to AI tools to help them understand how to get the best out the, out of them, is 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 it's extremely powerful. It's extremely helpful, and I think also crucially, it it helps get people into the situation where they can feel like, I suppose, they can feel this 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 confidence. They can feel. And um, that they are allowed to play with AI, and they're allowed to make use of it in order to make the most of 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 what's going uh, to make the use of technological progress. It's not something necessarily to be scared of. Obviously, it's something that you, you want to use with caution, with awareness. Um, but I think that that's sort of a, a very positive approach. And arguably, of course, it's the same as what's been done in the past when looking at privacy, what's been done in the past when looking at internet safety, and so on. Um, I suppose I don't know. I, I'm keen to actually open up and 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 let sort of others dive in. And I I know that Don will have have questions um ab about this all. Um, I suppose I know, everyone followed a lot of the discussion that's gone on around the use of of, of Chat GPT and, and functions like that in the academic context. And certainly, there's this arms race going on, which we've talked about in previous editions between um use of AI to produce articles and the development of tools to identify where AI has been used and recent stories that are indicating just like the share of scientific outputs that have been powered by this. I, I think I mean, this has been used by libraries in a really interesting way as a, uh, a learning opportunity, a way of actually understanding the limits of what's going on, of what you can do. There's some really interesting work just looking at what are the, the ethics and, and thinking through these ideas, thinking through this process about when it's appropriate to use it, what the limits are. Certainly, you can't you can't really trust the OpenAI sales team to tell you honestly about what's going what, what what it can do. I don't know. This is something that has to be done. But again, it comes back to that role of libraries, both in in helping to explain that that process, the the sausage factory that takes information from the original source into the format that it gets us in front of our eyes. It's a continuation of a past role, but I think, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to work with. I think it's, it's one of those things. It's a bit like when suddenly people started talking about fake news. Obviously, it's not great that people lie. It's not new that people lie, um, but it's a great opportunity to talk about information literacy and the importance of information skills. And it does actually at least put this role into relief. And I guess hopefully. To the degree to which we can we can demonstrate sort of scalable initiatives by libraries that draw on this sort of reach of libraries in order to teach AI literacy, to teach cotton. Well, we talk about AI literacy to talk about confidence and competence in working with AI. Then I think that's that's a really healthy thing. But I'm going to turn the computer. This is this is. This no, is no, we'll just slide look, back. Look at look at the camera work. It's amazing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Nothing, nothing but the best. <laughs> here, the media has arrived here, and they've given us press credentials for this conference. Um, you implied, and Nathan was explicit about the role for tr of trust in this whole thing. So, uh, all these capabilities to create fake news, fake images, fake voices. Uh, the uh, Warren Buffett came out a couple of weeks ago at their uh, annual uh, shareholder meeting and said that uh, someone had, you know, fabricated his his voice and it would have it would have fooled his own family and allowed someone to take advantage of them. And, and you know, he he was 
uh, concerned about the level of impact of this. He, he, the analogy he made was, uh, you know, nuclear weapons. We're talking about, you know, uh, really, he, he's not a guy prone to hyperbole. So it's, it's another voice. He's not alone, but it just, this feels like it has a, a real game changing possibilities for civilization and how we interact and how we are as, as people, uh, which is why I thought it was great that we could actually have two people together. And you don't know that I'm actually touching yeah. Stephen on the shoulder, but it, it's in fact happening here in, in, in we've got matching Russia. chests as well. It's great. <laughs> but but uh, you know this is this this mediation by AI and the ability to tune itself to each of us, each person, capable, potentially every person in the world could have their own assistant who would be who would know them you know, really completely, at, at least as, as far as what you could, what it could learn from uh, voice and uh, visual and, and habits and search terms and all the other things that are already kind of known by these same companies now can be amplified by these new tools. So it's a big deal. And how, how we can navigate this, how people can can navigate this is, I think, what as it is at the basis of the notion of literacy. You you could call it just coping, and it would probably be as an effective a term as literacy, because I I think it's not not applicable here. I don't believe that, like with you know studying uh, Chaucer and Wordsworth and Proust, we could become you know literate with AI. I don't I don't think there's an analogy there. I think we're all engaged in a highly dynamic transformation uh, that's sort of the the latest, you know, the pinnacle of, of our technological evolution. We just keep coming up with more impressive, uh, capable technologies until, until what? This is what we're all going to find out here, I think, in the not very distant future. So the point is that I believe Stephen was making was that where do you find answers? How do you, who do you trust? It's hard to trust the people that are providing these tools for profit. Their motivations can shift. However, they start out, you know, things can change. And, you know, if the board wants a new CEO to optimize the profit for the coming year, which may mean cutting costs, which may mean cutting the quality of services, uh, increasing prices, you know, and the rest of it, that's what happens. And that's what we actually have seen happen with big tech is there, uh, as we heard last week from Cory Doctorow, this kind of process of uh, degradation of these services, the, the re-intermediation of the internet, which was supposed to disintermediate all these kinds of relationships is back in a big way. Libraries do a lot of things more than anybody else in terms of the range of services, but people trust them. And this is this is as an asset has always been there, but I think it's rising, and it and its importance. And so, libraries have an opportunity and a role, uh, if not an obligation, to uh, help people uh, develop the the capabilities to to deal with this. So, um, that's. That's great. I mean, it's oh, it's true. great, but it's also a, a big a big challenge because they themselves have to figure out how to do it. I think we, we probably need to, we need to plug in your computer in a second, Don. But I I, I suppose yeah, we do. <laughs> we'll get on to that. <laughs> and I, I suppose to, to, to just picking up on on a couple of the points that 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 you made there. I think I don't know to some extent this is similar to the discussion about about fake news and arguably this sort of turbo turbo charges it. I don't know. To some extent, to, to me, it feels like this is a, a, a continuity. We're going to do this. This is this is more this is due as camera right work. There. Um, but so so I don't know you 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 talking about um <clears throat> talking about trust and the ability to actually be, believe what's going on. I, I think I don't know. I think we saw with fake news. We've seen previously that this is firstly 
pure trust and pure non-trust, I don't know, I think we're a little bit beyond that. I don't know, it's understanding the motivations behind things, how they may, how it may actually affect what's, uh, affect the positions that affect the positions, the nature of the information that's there and sort of coping with it, understanding what the implications might be. I know, I suppose when talking about literacy, I think... There's a riot. There's a... <laughs> um, I know, I... I I suppose I would see this, and just as the fake news previously, and and the use of AI tools now, it, it it's a call for a, it's a call for a um, I think a broader approach to literacies. Um, I think it, it and certainly talking about literacy is plural rather than literacy singular. Um, and so for example, in the way that you no, know, the way that media literacy used to be done, you would look at the title of the newspaper, you would see what color it was. Um, you would place it on a political scale from left to right and then use that in order to come up with a judgment on what their motivation might be. Um, it's a bit more nuanced than that now um, in, in, in in plenty of different ways. Um, I know that, that, I don't know, this is a, a line from data and, and, and society, which I think is, is there, I don't know, I think we're probably beyond this, I don't know, we're almost at the stage where what matters most is just it's a dangerous thing to say it, it, it's common sense it's equipping people with the the breadth of experience and the breadth of, of insight and the curiosity into the world so not just complete being critical of everything and distrust everything because that 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 that's a highway to conspiracy um but but it, it it's trying to build up that curiosity that desire to know more to sort of ask why um, to be ready to to help people to make a judgment where I don't know if 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 they hear something that looks like Warren Buffett and sounds like Warren Buffett saying something, nonetheless you have to accept that this could be a fake, and you need to actually make reference to and and, and use other broader experience in order to actually try and verify whether that's the case, and and, and that is a type of literacy. That hopefully steers the way between I don't know, credulity and incredulity, um, distrusting everything and just being into conspiracy or just taking everything at face value. And it's getting up to that stage. And, and I think that fundamentally goes to something that libraries are about that I don't know, within a school, the difference between the library and the classroom, the classroom is where you have the textbook and you are fed the information and, and you're fed one line. The library is the place where you read around the topic. And you broaden your experience and you understand there are different perspectives and and without going all sort of postmodernist, post-structuralist or, or, or whatever, you understand there are different approaches that, that there's lying, <laughs> um, there's different opinions. And, and But I think as AI becomes more of a thing, building up that broader, finding that balance between credulity and incredulity, finding that curiosity, finding that ability to deal with the fact that, that I don't know, we're in a post-truth world and so you need mm. to work out what is more truthful or not and helping people not to look at that yeah. with a sense of panic and not to look at that with a sense of, of doom, I think is, is a really important thing because otherwise people just will flip back into, sort of fold back into, into their sort of safe zones, which isn't ideal, or they go along with everything else. So I don't know, it, it, it's... And it's, yeah, a, it's a literacy it's, question. It's, That's what a, great, it's be a great at. point. And try to find a balance between just, you know, totally, total incredulity and and totally and duty. completely <laughs> complete <laughs> skepticism. Uh finding that find that balance. I think that's what they call critical thinking. And uh and and that's a skill that's gonna have to be increased. I just saw a uh a course outline from this uh, uh, Tina uh, person who is who is uh, presenting on June the fourth, and uh, she developed. She has a course. It's a freshman course uh, in effectively this in uh, in the matter of a semester. It's an entire course on kind of how to approach this, and so. Uh, that's oops. That we're, do, we're doing the furniture. Yeah, now. furniture. <laughs> Get the refrigerator moving in a second. And and that could it 
it suggests that this there's a justification to have a uh, uh, a whole course, a whole discipline to go along with geom. I mean, at, at K twelve level, there would be different appropriate kinds of of subject areas. And but the librarian, the school librarian, would be a, a person to lead such a development where it would first be kind of a special kind of field trippy kind of thing. And then it could be developed and incorporated into the curriculum. Uh, I think it's that significant in the way the other skills that are taught, like English or French or whatever the native language is and, and history and geography, this will be, this will be another element of a, of a basic education. And for the schools and then for People like us that are out of school, the general public, uh, that's where the public libraries will come in. And and that's the other point that I think makes it so uh, reasonable is that libraries have a long history of, of uh, uh, teaching these literacy courses, media literacy, data literacy, and so on, as Stephen was pointing out. So there's already a, a structure uh, 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 built in an experience base. And so adding this uh, new field into that uh, will make sense to a lot of people. They'll be looking for it, I would, uh, I would pose. Uh, libraries, this is from Kathy, if you read, libraries are trusted by their users, the rest of the community may not give libraries much thought. Well, it's often true. Governments uh, often see them as unnecessary costs. So how do libraries position themselves as key in this new age? How do they get the funding needed to be key? Inadequate funding, inadequate access to training for library staff, a long standing problem for me. So true, Kathy. Uh, it's, it's kind of our work uh, with libraries in response is to both uh, challenge librarians to be more assertive in their value because you are, you're tremendously valuable. If, if the statistics are holding up that half the population in the US at least are active library users, have library cards that they've used at least once in the past year, that's a huge population. We've identified three constituencies that would be extremely valuable to support libraries, but currently don't. Uh, as you point out, one are, our politicians, uh, they're, no, they're they're more vocal and verbal than than literate, I would say, uh, and so I, I think they're you know they're just so so in libraries unless the community thinks libraries are are great and then they support them. And so that's the that's the partial answer there is how do you mobilize your community to uh, get the message to your your managers, you know, the people that are managing the budget in your community, that you need more and better services and, and you better train better training. Uh, another group is, that is, dismisses libraries are technologists. Often you'll hear, you mean they're still around? You know, they just, they just go think of the internet as the only place to get information. And so it's just short sighted. Uh, libraries are ideal for technologies to be demonstrated and libraries as laboratories so this is a this is a good strategy is to uh and, and i know many of you have done this kind of thing is to actually set up uh spaces in the libraries for whatever technologies are coming out to you know to highlight them to showcase them uh, to demo them, you know, you do it with 3D printers and you do it with VR goggles or you do it with this stuff. And so building that reputation as a, as a place to explore emerging technologies is a natural. Uh, the other group are wealthy people. Uh, they, they tend to, I'm generalizing, of course, like crazy here. They tend to kind of admire the idea of libraries, but they're just not typically library users. They just one click for pretty much anything they want. Um, though they do happen to be the the population that, that donates the most to libraries, even though they're not uh, leading library users. 
being library users or younger people these days, which is a great development. Uh, younger people want an actual book. They have somehow uh, just intuitively understood that digital stuff, the digital content is not real, it's not tangible, and it's not property. It's not anything you can buy. It's only something that you can rent. Uh, Ebook, it's not yours. You can't, you can't give it to somebody, you can't sell it. And pretty much you rely on the, the publisher to let you read it. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, they can reach back and just withdraw the, the volume, as we saw a few years ago, when of all, of all uh, cases, uh, an edition of 1984 was pulled back because there was some dispute over, uh, uh, I don't know if it was copyright or, or probably, I think it was some editing that, that somebody was objecting to. And so it's, I think young people understand that, but a book, it's theirs, you know, it's, it's a real thing. And, you know, and that's great. Uh, and, that, and that's the hope. So drawing in people that are already inclined to libraries to be your champions, I just can't think of a better strategy. Uh, let, let them come in and, and, help you develop a, a, a technology based program and um, and keep at IMLS and your state libraries, which are great. We're so, so impressed with the state library agencies who, who uh, channel, of course, a large amount of federal money to local libraries and also uh, especially help out the smaller rural libraries. Um, we're coming up on the hour. <laughs> Uh, this has been a fairly chaotic session for session 100. <laughs> I'd say it's right up there, but at, le at least we maintain connectivity for the most part. And we had a really interesting, if all too brief, presentation from Nathan. Uh, so this represents uh, really part one in a two-part uh, exploration or initial exploration on public AI. Next week, we're going to get into it in, in a little more depth and we'll revisit AI literacy because we think those two go together so well. If you make the case for public AI, you have to make the case for AI literacy. They just go together like public roads, drivers who have been trained. So uh, be sure and keep an eye out and I hope you come back next week. Stephen, uh, last word. Yes, so I, 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 this is last, last word just to pick up slightly on, on what Kathy was saying. I think, and also what, what, what Don was saying, I think we still struggle to ensure that people see libraries as part of the digital infrastructure. Um, I think traditionally people tend to see libraries as being an educational thing or a cultural thing, and that, that's not to sort of denigrate that those areas, but libraries are so much more versatile. So I think sometimes it's just a question of the language we use and, and, and the frameworks we use. I think a, a readiness in libraries to partner it is really powerful. I, I know that because libraries can do everything, we often try to do everything on our own. And, and, and that is extremely stressful and, and um, it, 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 it's hard work. So also looking out for those partnerships at the local level and making sure that we're, we're able to demonstrate the benefits and actually sort of tell the stories, show the benefits of, of, of what lives are doing is, is is really important. But I think, I think that's almost as Don said, I know we are digital actors. We are part of the digital landscape. We are stakeholders. We have agency. We have something to say and something to contribute here and, and being ready just to, to, to kick down the doors to turn up to these meetings, to put hands up, to say, oh, and libraries, oh, and libraries, and keeping on mentioning that, I think is 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 a really important thing. Um, so I, I absolutely would encourage that. And I think that underlining, and, and I don't know, it's always horrible to go into situations and say, well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but coming up with a convincing narrative, and I think as Don was saying, public AI plus skills, and obviously we need to be really careful not to put too much of the responsibility on individuals in this space. There is a role for regulation, <laughs> there is a role for that. I don't know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really mean to tell individuals that if you get fooled by AI, it's your fault. Um, because I don't know, in the end, it's impossible, we can all be fooled. But nonetheless, I don't know, providing that combination of those skills, those regulations, those frameworks, those 
positive efforts to promote a, a public public interest AI infrastructure is, is that that I think that, that that it's a really attractive proposal. Hopefully it's a really attractive offer, really attractive narrative um, when approaching decision makers and of course when approaching funders. Absolutely. The 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 point about knowledgeable users is that they besides you know just self protection they also represent a voice in policy development they if they know more they can call for certain things that actually can propel this this necessary set of uh, public policies and restrictions and so forth uh that if they don't know then they're just leaving it to the very professional uh lawyers and engineers who you know they're great. They've done amazing things, but they they they're just not serving the public as their primary interest. It's just not the way they're built. We can't blame them. They're you no, know, there's what's what they do. That's what they're paid to do. So we have to find a way to offset that. And libraries are this wonderful offset to so much that's been privatized and monetized and commercialized. Uh, and you know some oftentimes to uh, to our general detriment. So libraries are essential. And that's the message that everybody has to believe and share. And speaking of sharing, Stephen, this is this is really something that we've managed to, uh, I mean, we've met before. I don't want to give that impression, but <laughs> that, uh, that we've met in person for session 100 of libraries and response. I can't believe we've, we've been doing this this long. We had our four year anniversary a couple of months ago, but this is this is a big round number. We know round numbers are meaningful. So thank you, thank my you. friend, yes, my you. partner in crime here. And thank you all for uh, being with us and contributing. And so we'll see you next week.